The date is Tuesday, May 14th, 2019. And I'd appreciate if you turn off all your cell phones as this meeting is being recorded. Ellen, can you please do our roll call? Thank you, Chairperson Granado. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Here. Mr. Healy? Ms. McCurdy? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Here. Vice Chairperson Mr. Hill? Chairperson Mrs. Granado? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative Ms. Eden Fritz Aguirre? Here. All present. Great, thank you. Okay, the board invites a group from the Highcrest School to come on up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you to all of you, and we're going to be hearing from you in a few minutes, I think. All right, Mr. Emmett, we do have staff and student recognition tonight. Uh, yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Granado. We have uh, two items this evening for staff student recognition. If I could please have my friends from Highcrest Elementary School come up. We're going to be doing a little presentation about uh, science, I believe. Come on up. Okay, hello, my name is Ann Malloy and I'm the Content Curriculum Specialist at Highcrest School and Hamner School. And we're very excited to be here tonight to share with you all of the great things that we've been doing at Highcrest School in the area of science, um, the next gen science standards. We've been integrating a lot of um, science with language arts and math. We have some very excited teachers who've been digging into some of this work. I brought with me um, Amy Caldwell, she's our kindergarten teacher at Highcrest. Jennifer Ferravanti, she's our second grade teacher at Highcrest. Sue Brush, she's also a second grade teacher. And Chris Fox, he's a third grade teacher at Highcrest. So, um, let's see. Without further ado, I'm gonna let Amy take over and talk to you a little bit about all of the great things she's been doing in kindergarten. Hi, good evening. Um, I have been having a lot of fun with the kindergartners doing light and sound. Um, this is our first time doing light and sound. It used to be a first grade unit, and so we're digging in and making it more kindergarten appropriate. Um, I've been working with Anne and the um, pilot committee. I've used Carol the Carolina unit, and we made it extremely engaging and hands-on, and the kids have been loving. Um, in this, these pictures, you can see they've been testing just different instruments to hear different sounds. We made drums and did telephones with cups. It was fun. Um, after this lesson, they, um, we had a discussion and learned that sounds make waves. Big, big ideas for kindergarten, but they're getting it. Um, then we moved on to light. We, um, I moved on to using Mystery Science, which is a, something that Weathersfield has an online subscription for, and my kids love. And um, we learned about how transparent, translucent, and opaque objects, ref um, how light, light goes through those objects, and we did art to figure out how light is absorbed. Let's see. Um, we, I also tried out inquiry workstations. It was my first time doing it, and it was really fun. They had a great time. Um, they, we, um, each workstation had standards that were connected to the performance expectations, and everything was hands-on and play-based, and they 
really, really enjoyed. You can see the first one was um, what will happen if I hold these objects to the light. It was so much fun for them. So cellophane, you would never think that, but it was fun. Um, how can, then the next one was how can light help me sort these objects? Kids then tried to figure out shadows. We took some of our toys out so they could use flashlights to give shadows. Um, then the other one was trying to figure out do you need light to see things? They were shocked that they couldn't see Lightning McQueen in there, but then you put an iPad in there, and they're like, wow, you can see it, things that you don't even realize, and it's so fun in kindergarten. Um, we use videos to um, watch things like Sid the Science Kid and explaining light and sound through, through technology. So um, I'm looking forward to working with the pilot committee as um, we end our school year to make recommendations for these new upcoming units. And that's it for kindergarten. Here comes second grade with Jen and Sue talking about their trash to treasure unit. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Jen Faravanti. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about our trash to treasure unit. Um, each unit begins with an anchoring phenomenon where students are really encouraged to um, think and wonder and question. Um, and to get them really engaged and excited about learning. So um, this Trash to Treasure unit, um, we started off by showing the students this slide. So the photo on the left is a picture of um, compost trash, and then the photo on the right is a picture of a big mound of rich soil. So the students are um, asked to look at this photo for a few minutes, and then um, they each have a T-chart where on one side they have to write what they notice about the two photos, and then on the other side they write some of the things that they're wondering. So um, I really like this piece of the lesson because um, there are some students who feel like, I don't, I don't know what I'm wondering or what am I supposed to be looking at. Um, so what, what we tell them is to just write everything that you see. And then a lot of times too, once they hear some of their um, classmates share out, they'll say, oh, I didn't notice that. And then that um, gives them some things that they start to wonder about as well. So it, it um, starts off a great conversation and discussion. After that, the students are put into science groups and they complete a group model um, where they work together to explain how they think the trash turns to soil. So what's happening here? And the students use, they create a diagram um, using labels, photos, um, and they try and explain. So this is also a really nice piece of the unit because students are respecting each other's thoughts. Everyone's uh, um, thought counts and matters and then they each have a special job to create this model. After the group model, the students engage in a gallery walk and one student from each group stays with their model while the rest of the class walks around and they have two different colored sticky notes. So on one sticky note, they'll write something that they notice about the group model and then a different color, they'll write something that they're wondering about the model. So maybe it's a question. Some of my students made little arrows and said, what's this? If they needed some clarification on one of the photos. Um, and it's nice that one student from each model stayed with their model so that they could clear any confusions up. Following the gallery walk, we create a driving question board, um, and that's where Mrs. Brush has an example of um, her class's driving question board, and that's where um, the common questions or thoughts from each group models are put together and sorted into categories just to organize student thinking and student questions, and this is going to help with the research piece of the unit. Um, sometimes this can be a little bit of a challenge for some students because they're not really sure what's happening from the trash to the treasure to the soil. So they have a hard time coming up with questions. So as teachers, we're guiding them, we're not giving them any, any information, but we're teaching them how to do that questioning piece. Okay, and that's followed by a really exciting piece for second graders, um, the research. So this is where the students are trying to come up with the answers to their questions using um, Chromebooks, iPads. We use um, PebbleGo, BrainPop Junior, different videos and articles, um, all child-friendly search engines to help them come up with some answers for their questions. 
Um, we did find during the unit, sometimes there's not too, too much um, child friendly on, on these engines about composting, so we provide them with articles and teach them how to annotate the article and, and get their information from that. Okay, and then we have the summary board. So while some questions from the driving question board gets answered, not all of them do. So um, this also, this brings up some new, new questions, of course, and we say, okay, well, what can we do to figure out these answers? So students, um, they can summarize their learning based on as a whole group, or they can also do it individually, independently. So we have a few more examples. of students, so what they use is they create their own explanation of how trash turns to soil, um, and they use certain keywords included in their models, and they are explaining how this process happens in their own words. So it's a nice way to really see how, how your students understood um, the whole unit based on their research and their thinking and their group conversations. Um, and then a nice activity that we did um, with a couple of the other grades was on Earth Day. We went outside and we collect, collected a whole bunch of trash from our playground. And um, it was kind of a nice way to end, end this piece of the unit because students were really took part in taking care of our Earth, taking care of the trash. And um, some questions even came up saying, well, what do we do with the trash if it's just here? Do we just put it in the garbage? Or what, can we, what else can we do with it to make sure that we keep our Earth um, a clean place. So now I'll introduce Mr. Fox, a third grade teacher, to talk about the wonderful work that his third graders did. Good evening. Um, my class is along with the second grade students. We picked up trash on April 22nd. It was green up day around the schoolyard and my students that came with me will explain more. But what Jensen's second grade with the driving question board the summary table, there's a big shift in science. It's not just your standard hypothesis. There's your scientific method. Now the students get to actually perform science in an organic way where they're that driving question board. We've developed lessons based on what they want to know. And it's the mystery science that the district has had this Christian has really helped with the opening phenomenon with pictures, videos. But I was very lucky, I think along with Amy and a few other teachers, we piloted the Carolina Biological Kits where we literally got everything we needed to do a whole unit. And that was very beneficial, very, very beneficial, because I had everything I needed, and I shared with my colleagues and my team to do that ecosystem unit. Um, but the main important difference about the science now is we did learn biology, we learned physical science all year, earth science. The last strand is earth and human activity, where students now can take a stand and make take action with science. So my four students are going to talk about what we did in our schoolyard in our classroom. My name is Shane, and I'm going to be talking about the high crest school, about picking up the trash for second grade, and about the problem that we found. This is a map of High Crest School. On Green Up Day, Earth Day, we, with second grade, we found seven huge bags of garbin, garbage around the school. We saw this problem and we made a map to see where we can put the trash. My name is Tony and I will be talking about how we made the pipe cleaner models to show how we help, can help our Earth. Next, we learned how other countries use creative garbage cans as a reward to pick up garbage. Then we drew models of our creative ways we, and built small models out, out of pipe cleaners. Hi, my name is Leia. After we took our drawings and placed them in different areas of the schoolyard map to see where we should put the garbage cans, this helped us plan our argument to convince the class. My name, my name is Gian, and I will be talking about how we shared our arguments and voted on a trash can. 
Finally, after we were done, we shared our arguments with the class. Then we voted whose was the best using Google Classroom. The results came in, and a basketball hoop style garbage can won. Now we are planning on now on how to make one for the schoolyard. Thank you for listening to our project, Go Green! And I just want to add, I mean, my whole class is very engaged in this, but as you can see from the slides, that every single subject matter area was incorporated in science. They were writing, reading, we even did math skills with social studies, and we did our math with the graphing and figuring out our next steps. So I just wanted to make that clear that science does drive a lot of the instruction. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for them? The, um, and you had come to uh, Student Program and Services, and it was an incredible um, night for us to be watching this new science curriculum being put out. But I have to tell you, I'm most impressed with the vocabulary that the children have and that they're learning. And they actually know the definition of the words translucent and environment. So thank you. Thank you I'm very much. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Now at this point in time, if I could please have Mr. Maltesi come forward to the podium with Mr. Jeff Weber. Thank you, Superintendent Emmett, Chairperson Granada, entire Board of Education. Mr. Emmett asked me to come here tonight so we could publicly recognize one of Wethersfield High School's uh, teachers and coaches, Jeff Weber. Uh, Jeff Weber has been coaching at Wethersfield High School for 20 years and in his tenure, he has led the Wethersfield High School track and field program to six divisional titles, five state championships, and the 2016 State Open Championship. And last week in Southington at the Aquaturf, he was presented in front of his peers with the 2019 Outdoor Track and Field Connecticut Coach of the Year. So we'd like to publicly recognize and thank you. Congratulations, you. Jeff. We're so proud of you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Well done, Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Okay. Now it gets boring. Um, next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes of our regular Board of Ed meeting on April 23rd, 2019. Anyone see any corrections? Okay. May I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Great, those minutes are approved. Also, the approval of the minutes for our special Board of Ed meeting on May 1st, 2019, that was our retreat. Are there any corrections? Okay, may I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. And second. a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Those minutes are approved. And last, the approval of the minutes for a special Board of Education meeting on May 7th, 2019. Um, are there any corrections? Okay, may I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. And then a second? <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Ellen, I'm gonna abstain. Abstain. All set? Okay, those minutes are approved. And 
we'll move on. Is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that we do have a five minute limit. Go right on up. Good evening. My name is Amy DeVoe. I live at 89 Hartford Avenue here in Wethersfield. I um, have been working with in the Board of Ed for approximately 14 years. I am the union president for the Secretary Perez Clerical and Media Union. Um, I'm going to share with you um, a statement on behalf of our negotiating team. We are currently in negotiations for a contract. Um, it has been going on for approximately two years. At this time, um, as paras, secretaries, clerks, and media, we know that our jobs are important. We work closely with students every day and provide academic support and so much more. Most of the administrators and teachers in our district offer us words of encouragement, such as paras and secretaries are the backbone of the school. We can't do our jo jobs without you, and we need you. Unfortunately, there is, a there is another line of thought that is regularly on display when it comes to our compensation and benefits, though rarely spoken out loud. This dismissive attitude toward Paris secretaries considered our work to be under, undeserving of basic benefits like health care that we need to support ourselves and our families, and our district is making it even harder for us. Our union has already moved into a high deductible plan, which we don't gain access to until we work over 30 hours a week. Now the district is working on systematically eliminating 30-hour workers from our district. Every time a 30-hour para or secretary leaves the district, they're replaced by someone earning only 29 hours or less. This is unacceptable. We come before you today with a simple message. We need affordable health care. While kind words are nice, we need access to affordable health care. If our jobs are important to this district, then help us get health care we can afford. Setting an unatt unattainable threshold for access to health care isn't a smart, cost-cutting move. It's forcing good people with experience to walk out the door. Good people will leave this district. It has already happened and will continue to happen. We ask the Board of Education members that if you value the work that we do, that you create benefit-eligible paras and secretary positions in this district. We are of value and worth and deserve an equitable resolution to our contract. Being paras and secretaries are, are our jobs that we use to support ourselves and our families. What we are asking for as a union is fair and reasonable. I also have a few statistics from just this year. 2018-2019 school year, we hired 28 paras. In the 2019 school year, 23 paras resigned. Nine paras left from Web Pre-K and the ABA program causing a huge disruption in the program and student consistency. Difficulty for students on the autism spectrum to consistently adjust to a different person on a weekly basis. Very high percentage left due to no insurance and higher pay. Some even said, I just took this job while I was looking for another because I need insurance. After Weathersfield spent the money to train them, they left to go to Middletown, Berlin, Meriden, Creck Magnet School, Adelbrook, West Hartford, Manchester, Cromwell, and Rocky Hill. The paras who were in their 20s needed insurance because they were coming off of their parents' insurance. Paras I talked to got new jobs with benefits, more hours in the day and the week, and more hourly pay. I just would like to say that we have a few paras that are going to give their statements, and I would just like you guys to think about that a little bit. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrea Velez. I'm a Weathersfield resident. I live at 18 Valley Crest Drive. I currently work as a paraprofessional at Weathersfield High School. I am also a member of the CSEA SEIU Clerical, Secretarial, and Paraprofessional Union. I was hired in September of 2016 as a 29-hour para, and this is my third year at the high school. My job is the single most rewarding job that I've ever had in my career. I began as a paraprofessional years ago and took time off to have my second child. I have also worked in other fields such as real estate and law, but nothing compares to being a paraprofessional and working with students every day. 30-hour paras in the district make up about one-third of all paras, and changing their insurance plan to a high deductible plan is just not affordable for some paras, especially those not, not making enough income. My income doesn't allow me to be able to afford the high deductible HDHP health insurance plan. 
We are one of the lowest paid group of employees in the district, yet we have one of the most important jobs. You are systematically eliminating 30-hour paras from our district, and it isn't right. Each time a 30-hour para leaves the district, you hire a 29-hour para in place of them. Most of the administrators and teachers that I have spoken to over my three years of employment have offered words of encouragement. Paras and secretaries are the backbone of the schools. We can't do our jobs without you. We need you. These words have stayed with me over the last three years, and to this day, I still continue to hear them. As a para, I feel that my job is very important, and I can assure you that every para in this district feels the same way. I work closely with students every day and provide not only academic support, but so much more. I have heard that some say that being a para is not a career. Some paras and secretaries that I work with have been in the district for 15 plus years, and I would dare you to say to them that their jobs are not a career. Paras and secretaries are some of the hardest working people that I know. We continue to re remain at the bottom of the totem pole, and this is just not acceptable. If our jobs are so important, wouldn't you want to keep us in this school district? Despite all of this, you have dedicated paras that have stayed in this district because they love their jobs, but the time has come to speak up and not allow ourselves to be treated as though we don't matter. Good people will leave this district. It has already happened, as you heard before, and will continue to happen. Being a paraprofessional is a career. It is not a disposable stepping stone. I ask the Board of Education members that if you value the work that we do, you create benefit eligible para positions in this district. We are of value and worth and deserve an equitable resolve to our contract. We are, what we are asking for a union is fair and reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. My name is Stephen B. Lewis, and I have been working as a paraprofessional in the Wethersfield Public Schools for 13 years. In my working adult life, I've worked in both public and private education as a laborer in shipping and in the insurance industry, both here and in New York City. I can say in all that time that I currently work with some of the best and brightest coworkers I have ever known. They put in countless hours of their time to benefit the special needs students here in Wethersfield, and they apply great skill in the classroom. My coworkers are the glue that holds together the mainstreaming of special education students in our school system and in our town. Personally, I am a certified teacher and coach. I graduated with honors from one of the best schools of education in the country and was the only one of my class of over 400 to achieve a perfect 10-point rating for my student teaching in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've been a highly successful coach for over three decades. In my time at Wethersfield, I have worked with students with a wide-ranging variety of disabilities, physical, emotional, autism, and behavioral. Sometimes this has been at risk to my own personal safety. I believe that I have given my utmost to help make the students that I've worked with successful in the classroom and beyond. As you are all undoubtedly aware, one of the biggest expenses we all face in our lives is medical care. Most of the paraprofessionals that I work with have no health insurance supplied by the town. As a class of employees, <laughs> most of us are intentionally kept at 29 hours per week, an hour under the threshold where an employer has to provide health insurance to its employees. In the time I have had to supply my own health insurance, this has been nothing short of a financial catastrophe. Having only the wherewithal to enroll in a, in a bronze exchange plan, this has meant having to pay thousands of dollars in co-pays dis despite my being in excellent health. For example, my visits to the dermatologist cost $160, of which the insurance company pays just $30. So I owe the dermatologist $130 just to show up and make sure that my long-term exposure to the sun hasn't triggered melanoma. It isn't as if I'm getting a facelift or Botox. In some cases, this has meant forcing me to skip screening tests because the co-pays would be hundreds of dollars. If I get any kind of severe illness, my insurance plan has a $5,000 annual deductible, but the plan doesn't pay 100% of medical expenses until I have paid $11,000. 
For someone making my hourly wage, this would be a financial death blow. To further complicate matters, I have no dental insurance. The cost of an individual dental plan is prohibitive. In a five month period, I've had to have two oral surgeries costing $2,300, all of which I had to pay out of my own pocket. The town of Weathersfield asks us to give so much of ourselves to the students in the classrooms and on the athletic fields. We do so with great aplomb. But to be honest, it is difficult to come into work every day with a medical sword of Damocles hanging over our heads. I love what I do, and I love to work with our children in the classroom. But I'll be honest with you, I have applied for jobs here as a custodian because it includes medical benefits. If the town and the Board of Education has the will, there are solutions for this issue that can be mutually beneficial and cost effective for both the town and the dedicated paraprofessionals who work so hard to make our schools and our students the best that they can be. Medical insurance is an important aspect of being a valued employee in education and in any line of work. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Patrice Motter, and I'm speaking a testimony on behalf of Antonio Leone. My name is Antonio Leone, and I will, will be finishing up my fourth year here in Wethersfield School District. I am very fortunate to have made a career as a 29-hour paraprofessional and to work along with some of the most dedicated administrators, teachers, and of course students in the entire state. I look forward every morning to getting into school and being part of a Wethersfield school community. Quite honestly, there is no other place I'd rather be. Being satisfied professionally does, however, come with a price tag in Wethersfield for the many 29-hour paraprofessionals who work without employer-provided health care. For most like myself, it comes at an expense of our families and children. I am happily married and have two children ages 11 and 9 that I need to provide for. Unfortunately, I am gambling with my family's health and betting on the fact that we remain healthy each year. You see, to keep the market health care premiums low, we have bet on ourselves and have chosen a policy with a $12,000 deductible. This is so that our premiums can be below 900 a month. The financial strain on our family is an all-time high, but ultimately we wake up each day knowing that any accident or health crisis will cost us thousands before any coverage kicks in. To help supplement the school income, I have taken on multiple coaching opportunities in the world of soccer. Although this was, was a passion I enjoyed, it has turned into a form of income to help fray the cost of our health care premiums. No longer fun, but a job I need. Fortunately, I have a family who supports me and understands how much I love my job and want to be a we at Wethersfield High. But admittedly, I feel like I am failing them by putting my career path ahead of their needs. I'm confident I'm not the only one in this position here in Wethersfield. There are so many paraprofessionals who are at the same crossroads and need to decide whether to give up something they love doing in order to provide to their families or leave this community for one of the surrounding districts that does provide health care to their paraprofessionals. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is, my name is Joseph Cleary. I've been working six years as a paraprofessional, 29-hour paraprofessional SDMS with no health insurance. I've been paying for my, health, my own health, health insurance and dental insurance out of my own pocket. I pay $56 a month for my, for my, uh, from out of my pocket and a deductible of $200. The administrators want to give me extra hours, but they can't increase my hours because of the insurance is issue. How this makes me feel that I am not a valued employee to the Weathersfield District. I feel that for six years there is no movement and I'm stuck at 29 hours. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Paula Martirano and I am a paraprofessional for the uh, town of Wethersfield. And I've been a paraprofessional for the past 14 years. I've been asked tonight to um, read the statement from uh, Ms. Virginia Apanovich, which she couldn't be here tonight because she has to work her second job. 
My name is Virginia Panovich. I am a paraprofessional for the Wethersfield Board of Education. I have been employed here for five years at 29 hours a week with a pay rate of $16.53 since I started on October 17, 2014. I want to first off by saying I absolutely love my job. I love coming in every day and working with students that I have watched grow since kindergarten. It's amazing seeing their growth, building that rapport with them and knowing that I could have made a difference at some point. I enjoy playing basketball with students during recess. Also, many of the students ask me to go to their football, basketball, and baseball games, which I love attending during weekends. A little bit about myself. I am a former Wethersfield resident and graduated from Wethersfield High School, class of 2000. My parents and siblings are still residents. I am a single mother of an amazing six-year-old little girl. As of right now, I have Husky insurance. I need my daughter to also have Husky instead of being under her father's anthem insurance or I will not qualify. I'm not sure for people who do not have Husky how, how know this, but many physicians do not accept state insurance. It is very difficult to find doctors and dentists that are close by the do. My daughter can only see her pediatrician once a year for physical checkup and has to wait an entire year to be seen again, unless for an emergency. It would be nice to be a full-time employee with benefits, although it will need to be affordable. With the pay rate I am right now, I can barely get by with the cost of living. It's a struggle every day. I work an additional part-time job at night, a couple of days a week, to try to make ends meet, and it's still very difficult. I miss out on time, or I should or could be spending with my daughter, having to work an additional job. Not too long ago, a friend of the family told me she could help me get a job in Rocky Hill at one of the school as a paraprofessional. She told me it would be full-time hours with benefits at a higher pay rate. It is very tempting. I told her I'm finishing up this school year and that I have built a rapport with students and staff that it would be hard for me to leave being I really enjoy and love working with the staff and the students. I love the town of Wethersfield. As I said earlier in this letter, I am from here. But with, with uh, while Wethersfield pays their paras with no benefits or place for growth, I may eventually have to look or eventually go to another school that will better my finances for my own family. As much as I will miss the students and staff I got so close to. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Riley and I'm a parent in this town and I'm a teacher in another district. And first I'd like to thank the board for the work that you do. It has absolutely far fewer rewards than it should and far more work than most people realize. That also goes the same for working with kids with special needs. I have one of the more expensive kids in your district. I don't want them to be expensive for you. I can't even tell you that's nothing compared to what it costs us. But he is successful here because of the people who work with him. From the paras to the coaches to the teachers, the people in the cafeteria who help him remember every day to wipe his face and be a responsible human being, he is successful because of the people in this town and in this building, and especially the board. And the people who work with him most are the paras. I hear every day about his paras, but what they say and what they do and what they've taught him. He talks about his teachers too, but his paras really stick with him on a minute to minute basis. They prevent meltdowns, they prevent illness by mentioning he doesn't seem himself today. The notes that I get home from the paras are invaluable. And knowing that the paras are not properly supported makes me really sad. And the success of one child in a building contributes to the success of all. When you have consistency of adults working with the kids, those kids do better. They always do better. When I teach in my district, if I have a sub, no matter how good my sub plans, no matter how great a job I've done preparing my kids for my absence, I am absent. And when the paras who work in my room with me are absent, my kids feel that too. And if I have a new para or a para who hasn't had the experience of my grade level or my students' degrees of needs, I feel that also. And if I feel that, so do the other kids in my room. There's cost and there's value. And if we value the success of everybody in the room and everybody in the building and everybody in the school and everybody in the town, we have to support the people who contribute to that success. And when we contribute to that, we all win. 
all of us. Yes, it costs. Everything costs something. But the cost of success never, never, ever equals the success that you get from it. And a child successful in this district, no matter their ability, will bring success elsewhere wherever they go. We moved here for these schools. We have not been disappointed. And I hope that the people who help my children, both my son with special needs, my gifted daughter, and the baby who knows what she's going to be. Good luck to everybody who works with her. <laughs> we are here because these schools are wonderful. And they are wonderful because of the people in them. And the people in them shouldn't have to worry that they're going to be sick and can't afford to not work. That they can't afford to work and they can't afford to stay home. They can't afford to stay home with their kids. And maybe they're not getting the health care they need in advance that will prevent them being out. And when they're out, someone else has to take their spot and do their best. And they really do do their best. All the substitutes do. You can be substituted, but you cannot be replaced. And if you know the children in the room, even, the, even if you're a one-on-one, -on -one, the child that you're working with is part of a community. And when you help that one kid, everybody's successful, including the children who watch you do your work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kathleen Sullivan, 79 Wright Road. I don't know how I'm going to follow that. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Wethersfield, and my, my children went through the amazing Wethersfield public school system, and including having a very special teacher who will go unnamed. Um, <laughs> but um, I also would like you to know that you are blessed to have my sister as a paraprofessional working in your school district. Uh, she has been here for quite some time. And um, I know all the joys and the frustrations of her being a para. Um, I hear about the wonderful things and connections that she makes. I have met some of her students because they continue into her private life. They uh, have gotten such a bond with her. So I have met some of her students. I've also been with her in public when students from, don't go with her to the Corn Fest, with students from everywhere come flocking over to see her because they're so excited. And these are not her students that she's assigned to. These are just the other students in the classroom. So she's having an effect on everyone. Um, she has had wonderful experiences. She has also had very stressful and difficult experiences. She has been kicked by students. She has been, um, how to say it nicely, she has been grabbed in a way that would be described as sexual harassment by um, children, uh, uh, older children. Um, you know, she doesn't tell me names, but I hear stories. Um, and yet she feels that she's not respected um, in what she's giving. Um, she's not, you know, the paras in general are not being respected. They're not, they've been told that they're not professionals, that it's not a, a career. To her, it's a career. That's, that's what she has dedicated her life to. And if she has difficult days, she gets over them and goes back and takes care of those children. So I really think that it's very important, not only that they get their contract, but that they're treated in a professional manner because these people are professionals. It's right in their job description, the word professional. And um, hopefully this can be taken care of because I know if all the pairs did walk out, which I know they never would, the school would fall apart. They couldn't go a day without all of the pairs there. So um, thank you for listening. And I know your job is hard and nobody wants to pay taxes, but I'll pay more if it helps the pairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Maura Healy, 38 Stillwell Drive. Um, I just wanted to comment um, with regards to the pairs. Um, I'm also a, uh, a parent of a child who has benefited from the paras in Weathersfield. I didn't realize that that was going to be a topic of discussion, so I um, commend them. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of a group of concerned and frustrated parents and children involved in the Weathersfield hockey program, high school hockey program. Let me start by saying this is an, ex is an extreme let me start over. Let me start by saying there is an extreme fear of retaliation by the parents, current players, and future players here today. We feel there are many things that are not working in this program. We are afraid that by advocating for our children and our children advocating for our, themselves, 
there will be consequences for some of our current and future players this upcoming hockey season. There are many players who were, uh, there are many people who were not willing or comfortable to come and speak today. They are afraid of the implications and the bias that will be held against their, ch their children this next hockey season. This is a terrible feeling and it should not be happening in the town of Wethersfield. We understand not everyone has the same feelings regarding the high school hockey program, program and we respect that. I'm going to provide the, the board with a little background on the sport of hockey. If you have ever been involved, the community, the camaraderie, and the passion for the game is like no other. When you have a child who joins a hockey program at a young age or even at a high school level, they have such a passion and love for it. It is a massive part of their life and becomes an integral, integral part of their upbringing. It's not a drag to go to practice doing something you love except for 4 a.m. practices. Many of the parents and children here played hockey and love to watch their children play. Many parents here may not have played hockey growing up, but they will tell you their, ch their child fell in love with the sport. Any parent would agree if their child is happy doing something they love, that is what any parent wants. This is not a group, a group of uh, disgruntled parents thinking their kid is going to go to the NHL. This is a group who feels it is time to step up and make a change in a program that has been held hostage. As a group, we have an issue with the current high school hockey program and its coaches and coaching style. We have brought our concerns to the athletic director, Mike Maltesi, Principal, Principal Moore, and Superintendent Emmett. Many phone calls, emails, meetings with both kids and parents seem to have no impact. At least it feels that way. There needs to be a change. Here is what we see. In 2019, the current coach has been with this program for over 30 years. Some here tonight played for the current, current staff and now have children playing. Hockey has evolved and running a practice, doing a drill or adjusting in stressful game situation takes an adaptable coach. We feel the high school coaching staff is out of touch with the youth today. We see favoritism and discrimination. The players who don't speak up and don't ask questions are the ones who are coached. If you do speak up, you're considered disrespectful. Everyone needs to be coached and developed. There are differences across any team and as a coach and a mentor, there should not be discrimination if these differences don't fit your agenda. Sadly, during the hockey season, every day, many of these young men come home are, and are frustrated, disappointed, and are feeling they want to quit and give up the sport they love. We see this program as part of our children's high school experience. Most of them have beautiful memories of their youth hockey days and stories to tell when they are older. They have dreamed of playing and representing the town of Wethersfield at the high school level. Many, many will have mixed emotions and memories of their high school hockey careers under the current coaching staff. We see a pattern of mis uh, mistreatment, unethical behavior, and abuse of authority. We as parents and our children are stepping up and advocating for our, ourselves against a coach who is, doing, who is not doing the right thing and a high school faculty that listens but takes no action. We see our children learning some very valuable lessons in uh, the current environment. Problem solving skills, finding a solution, how to address an issue in a mature fashion and being, being respectful. These are children, but they understand what is happening here and the example being set by the current coach and staff. As a parent, I don't think this example is a positive one. On the flip side, many of us here have mixed emotions about what we are doing here and why does it have to come to this point. We are not comfortable bringing this issue to a public forum like this. We cannot be ignored any longer. We appreciate the board listening to our frustrations reading our lengthy emails. We thank each of you for all you are doing for our community. We know it's not easy, but we, you are appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Cassio. My son is Andrew Cassio. I just wanna let you know he has played hockey since the age of five and has had a love and passion for the game since then. 
It's only come to the last three years when he's, when he's played for the high school that that passion that he's had for this game and the love of the game has diminished. First, I would like to say thank you to the Board of Education for taking the time in hearing our concerns and reading our emails. There's my conversation tonight will be short because all of the information has been identified to the athletic director, to the principal, and to Superintendent Emmett. I was promised that these investigations were not gonna be swept under the carpet. So I hope by now that you have read the concerns from me regarding the boys hockey team. My story is only a snapshot of the entire picture. And I hope from the information you have gathered from the others here this evening and those that are sitting at home watching on TV that you will understand this picture and it becomes clear because we are looking to you, to you for guidance in correcting this matter which has gone on, gone on for way too long. <clears throat> We are asking that for change, and we feel it is necessary to make the environment on the boys hockey team a much healthier environment for all of the athletes involved. There have been many issues which we have presented the administration, and again, as Maura said, we feel like it's falling upon deaf ears. We have been told to let the system play itself out. We did. We were also promised from the administration in playing itself out that in the reevaluation of the coaches for next season, human resources would be also take a part in that evaluation process. To my knowledge, human resources was not involved. <clears throat> the coaching staff, in my example, has has broken confide confidentiality conversations they, and they have not led by example as mentors to our children. While we respect the head coach for his years of dedication to the sport, we support the idea that the Wethersfield High School hockey team needs a new, a fresh perspective moving forward. Please, Consider reopening the coaching position to an outsider that can, add a community, that can add to a community of hockey players who now are thriving. If status quo continues, it is our belief that the Wethersfield High School boys hockey program will be, will be deprived of reaching its full potential. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Kate DeMora, and I am the mom of Andrew Cassio. He has played on the WMRP hockey team for the past two and a half seasons, and I wanted to share two things with you tonight. One, my thoughts on why more parents aren't here, and two, how the coaches seem to believe they are above the rules. Many of the parents who are here are surprisingly of players who play hockey, and by, by that I mean they don't sit the bench. They are on the starting lines, they play. This isn't a group of disgruntled parents who kids don't get playing time. This is a group of parents coming to you upset with how their children are being mistreated and how this program is run. You might ask, if that's the case, why aren't there more of you? And why haven't you come to us before tonight? And the answer is twofold. Parents and players don't think anything will be done and a change will not be made with a coach that's been there for 30 plus years. And two, and most importantly, they don't want their son to end up like my son. They don't want their child to end up being a target and embarrassed to the point of walking away from a sport he loved. Andrew came to me his sophomore year and told me that if I knew what went on behind locker room doors and in practice, I would not want him playing for the current coaching staff and I ignored him. How could a parent do that? I'm embarrassed to say I thought it couldn't be that bad 
because of my son's success on the ice and the team's success as well. It is my hope you will look, unlike me, beyond their winning record to see what is going on beneath the surface. Winning isn't everything. Not when you are losing kids' love for the game, their self-esteem, and their overall happiness in the process. This is a situation and environment that cannot be ignored. Action needs to take place. Something needs to be done to protect our kids and show them that this treatment and what has been done is not okay. I don't want one more kid to be on the losing end, as my son has been, of the retaliation culture that exists currently. And that's exactly what happened to him on an away game in February at Wesleyan University when my son ultimately walked away. The coaches knew what they were doing that night. They used confidential information Andrew's father confided in the coaching staff and used it to bait my son. They knew what his reaction would be. But instead of focusing on the specifics of that, because what I've learned so far in this process and the meetings that we've had, it becomes a he said, she said situation. Because some players heard it, some players did not. So instead, I'd like to focus on what happened after my son walked out of an away facility, because that is black and white. As my son walked away, no coach tried to stop him. No one followed him out. No coach contacted me, Andrew's father or stepfather. The coaches did not only try to prevent him from leaving, but they didn't follow up with him to make sure he was picked up by a parent. I wasn't at the arena as the scenario unfolded. His dad wasn't there, nor was his stepfather. I got a call from my son en route. He said his phone was at 1%, and he would send me his location because he was afraid his phone would die. I found him outside of the Wesleyan University on a street by himself, no coach anywhere. My husband ended up texting the head coach that night, asking him to please call him about what had transpired. The coach texted him back after the game and said he was too tired. He would call him the next day. Absolutely zero concern for my son. What if something had happened to Andrew? What if I wasn't able to find him? Are we only going to take this type of negligence seriously when someone does get hurt? Why would seasoned coaches simply let that situation unfold as it did and show no regard for the safety of their player? To me, it seems they don't think much about the well-being of their players in general, nor do they have regard for the rules in place to protect them. If they feel they can disregard one rule, why not another? The coaching staff has demonstrated this type of disregard to me since Andrew's freshman year when we were late registering Andrew for hockey. Andrew had not obtained his yellow card from the athletic office before the first day of practice. But the head coach told Andrew to come to practice anyway, not just come, but fully participate in practice. So instances like this show me that the coaching staff feels like they are above the rules. I was asked at our very first meeting with the school administration what I wanted the outcome to be. I told them I wanted my son, what my son endured not to be in vain that something good can come from my son being pushed to quit the sport he's been playing since five. He's not the first student to walk away from the hockey because of the current coaching staff's tactics, and if nothing changes, he will not be the last. If nothing is done, you are sending a significant message to your student athletes, specifically your hockey players watching this play out, and also to your coaches who coach them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Bruce Cutcomp. Uh, I was a four-year player under the same coaching staff that's there right now, and I'm a current coach at the Weathersfield High School for the lacrosse team. Um, I'm here to speak on what I believe is a, a major part of coaching, is not only how they develop as players, but as they develop as young adults. Um, I think there's been a complete lack in that insight at that level of hockey at the high school. Um, as you grow as a player, you should also be growing as a human being and as an adult. And taking that into fact is uh, kind of being sh thrown out the window by the current coaching staff. When you play favorites and don't give everyone a fair shot and you're only liking the kids who do everything right and you're not taking into account who maybe the kid who does something bad, you're missing out on a very big opportunity of your coaching. Um, those are the kids you need to look for out for just as well as the kids who do everything right. You're trying to grow this, these uh, children, young adults I should say, into adults and transition them into college. Um, 
I think this administration at, at the hockey team right now is doing no justice of growing these kids. Um, there's been a, there's been a lack for 12 years, as far as I know it, if not more, since I've gotten out of that team. Um, it's been the same thing since I was there. Kids quitting if they're not the favorite. Kids leave because he will single you out. That coaching staff will pick you apart. They will make you feel ostracized in the locker room, and that's something a coach should never do, and that's something a student in the high school level should never be exposed to, let alone at the college level or even at the pro level. So I, I would really like, and I'd be very happy if the administration would look into this hockey team finally and do something about this because it's been going on for far too long and something needs to be changed. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? My name is Brian Healy. I'm a lifelong resident of the town of Weathersfield. I want to thank the Board of Ed for taking the time to hear us speak uh, regarding the Weathersfield High School hockey program. This was a last-minute last effort by the parents who just found out on Friday that the administration was going to renew the contract for the current head coach. There would be more players and parents here, but the majority of them are scared of the retaliation of speaking up against the coach. I hope you all received my email and had a chance to read it. I know it was long, but I had a lot to say. I, I don't believe this coach has the best interest of the majority of the team at hand. He has the favorites, and those are the players that he is there for. Just recently, he asked a fellow coach that I know, how much longer do you intend to coach? His response was, two, three more years. I want to get a couple kids through their senior year. To me, and I hope to the board, that this is just unethical in itself. You should be as a coach there for all the kids, not just a couple. After a game in which the team lost, the coach told the kids it wasn't his fault, that they need to look in the mirror. He threatened my son, Jack, if you don't have your garment bag the next game, he wasn't playing. The next game came around, Jack had his garment bag, and one of the coach's favorites forgot his jersey, played with no disciplinary action, no threatening. This is a common theme with the head coach, the threatening, whether idle or not, the favoritism to certain players. Both players and, as worst of all, parents see it all. I beg the board to step up to this. The current coach has been here for 30-plus years. He believes that the program is his, not the Weathersfield school systems. He does not work in town. He does not live in town. He doesn't pay taxes in town. This coaching job is a hobby to him in the wintertime. We ask you for a change for the upcoming season so all the players can feel a part of the team and have the same opportunities, not just the chosen few that the coach picks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Vonick. I uh, actually played on the Wethersfield hockey team from 2008 to 2012. Um, <clears throat> kind of as an outsider already, being the only girl. Um, I definitely always felt very scared to speak up when I was there. Um, every practice on and off the ice is just very intimidating and you always feel like you're being put down. Um, you kind of see the players that were favorites, they always go off by themselves and the coach wants to work with them while everybody else doesn't really do anything for the rest of practice, which isn't developing the team as a whole. Um, and that just carries over to the games where you're driving these five to eight players into the ground when they shouldn't be on the ice for that long. Um, I was upset sometimes that I didn't play, but I understood that I wasn't as good as other players, which was okay with me. It was more of the off ice abuse that really everybody faces day to day. Um, from the coaching staff that bothered me the most. And had I been who I am today then, I 100% would have quit and definitely would have said something more speaking then because you just get put down all the time. And that's hard to deal with when you're that age. And I would love to see a change just so that those kids could be better and have a better experience. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rich Monick, Jennifer's dad. I live at 62 Butternut Circle. Um, came to Weathersfield actually the season that they won the division. 
my oldest son, we came from Hamden. He played on the team. Um, he had some concerns, and he worked it through, and he was happy with it. However, my other children, I have uh, another son besides uh, my daughter Jennifer, um, Kyle, who sent you all an email about his experience his senior year. I don't know if you read it or not, but um, that was a very difficult time for him. Um, coming into the season, coach wasn't sure he was going to have enough players for the team. So my son Kyle and another student uh, were considering not playing. In fact, they told coach, we're not playing. And he said, okay, well, you know, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And they were like, coach, you, you can't. You, it's just the way you run practice and that kind of thing. So they kept talking to him. And uh, eventually, coach said to the other kid, hey, Kyle's going to come. He's, he changed his mind. He's going to play. Well, I get an email from that son, that other player. His father said to me, hey, Rich, I thought you said Kyle wasn't playing or he hadn't made up his mind. And I said, you're right. He hasn't made up his mind yet. And he's like, you're kidding me. He just told, my son just told me that coach told him that your son's playing. And I said, well, no, Kyle hasn't made up his mind yet. In fact, he, he talked to Mr. Weber, one of his other coaches, because Kyle played on numerous teams, and uh, he got good direction from Mr. Weber. And um, eventually he made up his mind, and he did play. Um, they, didn't, they had an okay season, but, you know. The only other thing that happened during that season is Kyle, <clears throat> I didn't think he put it in the, the letter, he had two concussions. Mm. I was there when it happened, and I said, oh, the trainer's looking at him, and he, they're taking care of him. Oh, he must be okay. He's back on the bench. Hey, coach is putting him out in the game. Well, yeah, he's got to be fine. Well, he wasn't fine. And then the next day, or that night, I was like, Kyle, you all right? He's like, no, I don't feel good. All right, so he went through the concussion protocol, which had just gone in the year before, I believe. And so there was a test, and then he went through the test again, and he passed it a week later. Okay, fine, you can play, you can play again. And I was okay with that. And he got another concussion. And the same kind of event happened. Except that time, it wasn't our trainer. It was the other school's trainer because we were at an away game. I don't know. I, I just think that there's been many red flags throughout the years. And I, I did bring this, some of these points to Mr. Moltesi. I never went to Principal Moore. And I just felt that I needed to come out so that no other kids coming through this program go through things like that. So I just hope you all consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I just have to comment that we can't make comments, so please understand. It's very challenging. Anyone else for comment? Okay. Mr. Emmett, do you have communications to share? I do. Thank you, Mrs. Granato. Good evening again, everyone. I want to start off this evening with an update regarding the budget. Just before tonight's Board of Education meeting, Town Council came together to vote on uh, the budget, which is required by charter no later than the 15th of May. At this point in time, the council approved a budget uh, for the Board of Education that shows a total reduction in our budget of $1,400,000. Of that, $368,212 uh, is a reconciliation of the benefits for um, the custodial maintenance staff as we shifted that over to the town. So that is a total of $1,031,788 that we're going to have to come up with in terms of reductions. So our administrative team will be meeting tomorrow uh, for our uh, bi-monthly admin team. We will start looking at ways uh, to reduce the budget to where council has allocated. 
and do so with a minimal amount of impacts on programs and supports for students. This is a very difficult uh, reduction and one that uh, is going to take a lot of work to uh, avoid impacting programs and impacting our students. A couple of other items this evening. Uh, we've been working with the United Way for the Alice Challenge. Uh, we've had the opportunity to meet three times over the past month uh, with representatives from the United Way, um, as well as a variety of different individuals from uh, across the town, a great cross-section, if you will. We'll be meeting again to finalize the proposal uh, for presentation before the United Way uh, funding committee uh, next month. So we're looking forward to getting some grant funds to uh, do some work with our Alice families. I want to uh, give everyone the heads up, the train startup. We have an official date at this point in time. June 3rd is the official date for the resumption of the train service through Wethersfield. Signage has been placed at crossings notifying residents. Stop and yield signs have also been installed at crossings but are currently covered. We have a rollout that will be coming about starting next week with regard to Operation Lifesaver. So I want to make sure everyone in town is aware of the fact on May 21st May 22nd and May 23rd, representatives from the Connecticut DOT as well as the railroad will be at uh, various crossings here uh, in Wethersfield. On May 21st, they'll be at Jordan Lane and Knott Street. May 22nd, they'll be at Church Street and Wells Road. And on May 23rd, they'll be on Maple Street and Mill Street. Uh, there will be a work zone set up there, so parents bringing kids to school do be prepared. Staff going in in the morning be prepared for potential delays. Uh, they'll be giving out uh, information with regard to uh, the startup of the trains. I do not have a set schedule yet at this point in time. They could come through at any time, but uh, we certainly want to get the message out. Uh, with regard to our schools, we've done a PSA. Thanks to Mr. Brown at the high school, we've done a PSA uh, out to the entire district. We've done uh, assemblies at uh, all K uh, through six schools as well as uh, grade seven and eight. So that's the middle school. We've also reached out to our neighbors at Corpus Christi as well as Discovery Academy to make sure that the message gets out. Um, and then finally tonight, it is hard to fathom, but we are exactly one month away from graduation. Uh, so the class of 2019 will be uh, marching on. There is a significant amount of uh, planning currently occurring as we prepare to bid our seniors farewell. Uh, we are waiting for caps and gowns to arrive. Uh, the diplomas are here. So Mrs. Granado, you'll be signing them shortly. Um, and we're in the process of uh, preparing Weathersfield Cove uh, for the event. With the weather being as poor as it's been for the last month, we can only hope that we have uh, sunshine, dry weather, and uh, nice temperatures for that event. In the event that we are inside, we will be at Weathersfield High School. So uh, that's communications. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Emmett, Diane? Uh, Will we be having a special board meeting over the next couple days um, to go over these proposed cuts and what we're going to be doing? Because our, meet, our meeting is in two weeks. So are we going to be having a special board meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to need to do that. Absolutely, Diane. Okay. So When will the uh, suggested cuts be shared with us? We'll meet tomorrow morning, and I hope to have something out to you tomorrow afternoon for consideration. So. As you know, we met with town council and we were provided with the opportunity to come up with reduction scenarios of 500,000, a million, uh, 1.5 million, and 2 million. And uh, when we met with council, we talked about the fact that these numbers were quite fluid. Um, as I mentioned before, we're really looking to try and reduce the impact on kids. But the reality here is we don't have $1.4 million of pencils um, you know, I found it interesting and ironic tonight when we were watching the um, Highcrest presentation. You know, one of our few initiatives was to continue to um, fund Chromebooks and technology. And all of those pictures, what did we see the kids mm -hmm. engaged in, even at grade K, engaged in technology. So, you know, we'll look to see what we have remaining in this year's budget. If we can purchase some of the Chromebooks this year to replace those units that are going offline, we'll certainly look to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, we'll look to try and minimize the uh, impact of staff. Um, we've got some retirements and some resignations, so hopefully through attrition we can, if we have to, and we, I say if, when we have to reduce positions. It's inevitable. That's just too, de too deep a cut. So um, we'll definitely get that to you as soon as we can. Okay, and as the board knows, let me just finish I, uh, to help you, um, the administration recommends cuts. The board is the one who has the the priorities. Diane? Um, 
just just so you can clarify the numbers, what what's the net reduction? You mentioned the benefit count. So what's what's the total reduction that we have to come up with? Total reduction is going to be the one million thirty one thousand. Yeah. And in that is, um, what are we going to do about the teacher's retirement contribution? Because that probably will not be settled until sometime in late June or during a special session. It's a great question. Right now we're carrying that in our budget. It's approximately two, just shy of 250000 Okay, so we've budgeted for that. So that's we did. something mm -hmm. in addition Correct. we'll have to come up with. Okay. But if there are any changes to the ECS or anything that comes out of the... Um, the state budget, that that number could go up. Mm -hmm. Anyone else for Michael? Okay, thank you. I will right, we'll move on to our action items this evening. Um, Elaine, could you please read motion 6A for us? Yep. Move that the Wethersfield Board of Education approve the schedule of the regularly regular Board of Education meetings for the 2019-2020 school year. Okay, and everybody had a chance to look at it. Do I have a second for that motion? Second. Is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion 6A passes. John Morris, can you read motion 6B for us? Move that the Wethersfield Board of Education approve the proposed student use of private technology devices update. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? John? Yeah, um, there's a significant part of this that was very troubling to me that I mentioned at our last board meeting. It was the search and seizure part of the uh, policy. The rest of the policy I really had no problem with. We've had a lot of discussions over the last few years about um, the use of cell phones in the classroom and by students. Uh, the one section of the policy that talks about allowing administrative staff to um, search students' privately owned technological devices, meaning cell phones and or computers that they bring to school, I think is a significant Fourth Amendment issue for us and one we should not be doing if there is an issue with regards to what students are doing or saying or acting on their own private devices. I think that becomes a more of a law enforcement matter than an educational matter. We ought to just call the police and let them do their thing. So I have a real problem with that section of the proposed policy. I spoke earlier this evening just before the board meeting with Linda Yoder, who's one of our attorneys, and um, I think she would probably agree with me that that section as written is very problematic and we should be second guessing it. So my suggestion is that we table this until we have a little more fuller discussion with council about whether we can or should do that or whether if we approve it it's going to cause us more problems than we really want to take on okay do you want to make a ta uh, motion to table it i move that we table this uh, policy revision at this time second. okay second do i have any discussion on that i, have, I, have I do have to say michael i thought we did get a reading from the lawyers we did we got a reading from uh, attorney marr and then attorney marr Actually, Mr. Morris came forward with some additional information that I sent off to Attorney Marr. Attorney Marr is actually out on paternity leave right now, so Ms. Yoder, uh, Attorney Yoder, took it up. And actually, ironically, with regard to the case, the TLO case, uh, Attorney Yoder actually litigated that case in New Jersey. So yeah. um, a, lot of, a lot of background on it. So um, I had a conversation with her today, um, had her reach out to uh, Mr. Morris, hence here we are at this point. Okay, so, so yep. that's where we stand. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, John? that was my question. You you know, I thought that we had um, requested some information. Also, do we know what other districts are doing? Have other districts mm -hmm. adopted this the way it was presented? Do we people know that? People that use Shipman and Goodman, you mean? Yeah. The people, other districts that use Shipman and Goodman. I don't know if that's a good question, John. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. to see. We found it. We feel it's an yeah. issue. From Weathersfield, I'm wondering what other districts have done. Well, they mm -hmm. don't have a lawyer on the table, maybe not, you know. He knows the laws, and I'm proud of them for bringing it up for us. It's, it's in the committee, the Diane? property planning committee, right. that we, this was an issue that we that we wrestled with and we brought forward, and um, that's why we had requested something from them, because I had concerns, and I think some other people on the committee also had concerns. Um, 
color of the, the color of the print, the background. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's important that we look into this because I have Absolutely. some concerns. And I, I think I mentioned that last year and this year there was some legislation um, regarding that because I know my agency was actively involved um, in, the, in the development and addressing that pending legislation. So I think it's important that we take another look at that because okay. I think it leaves us open to, as John said, um, some explosion. Yeah, I agree and with John and Diane. I think we better do it right the first time <laughs> instead of have it come back and be biting us. So I agree with John and Diane. Okay. D just so I everybody mean, understands, the, the case we're talking about is called TLO versus New Jersey. It's a case that was involving a 16-year-old girl who was caught smoking in the bathroom, interesting enough. And um, when the administration in that town did a search of her handbag, that's what sparked the issue because they found other things in there beyond her cigarettes and it resulted in a criminal arrest. And that bounced up and down the New Jersey uh, court system at the trial level, the appellate level, the state Supreme Court level, and then the U.S. Supreme Court level over wow. something like four years. And I'm afraid to think about how many millions of dollars it must have cost any of this be before it was ultimately resolved at the Supreme Court level by upholding the search, but on some fairly narrow grounds. But that's a 1985 case, long before we had cell phones mm -hmm. and technology mm -hmm. devices and everybody having their own little computer they walk around with, which has every element of our life listed on it from who we talk to it and where we've been and what we've done. There have been several Supreme Court cases since then, including one just last year, um, uh, which I have here someplace, um, but um, Carpenter versus United States and that rejected the state's ability to put monitoring, uh, to use cell phone technology to locate where a defendant was at a given time. And so this is an evolving area of law. And even if you agree with the notion of searching for whatever disciplinary reasons you think are appropriate, you really don't want to be a test case to find out how much no. it costs to figure out whether that's the right way of doing it or not. So I think more thought goes into mm -hmm. this than action right now. Well, what we have in our favor is time, because yes. we didn't even want to implement this until the next school year. Right. So I agree. Right. Uh -huh. We can move Good. cautiously here. Anyone else for discussion on this? Because the motion is on the table. Two table. <laughs> all right. So let's look both ways here and think, are we all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? OK, the motion to table 6B has passed. Okay, and tonight we have the first read on the report of the assessment committee on their report and presentation. So are you ready? Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. I thank you ahead of time, yes. It's gonna be a short meeting. <laughs> And as, as uh, <laughs> as uh, Mr. Sutton gets set up, this um, assessment committee came about through the board's desire to take a look at the assessment uh, calendar, the number of assessments, the frequency, what works, what doesn't work. So what we did uh, was to develop a uh, committee and the committee is comprised of our professionals from across our five elementary schools. Um, invitation was given out to all K-6 staff members, so we have a, a great deal of uh, expertise before us this evening, so at this point in time, we'll turn it over to the uh, committee. All right, and I'll wait for my slideshow. Good evening, board and members. Um, my name is Katie Nunn and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Emerson Williams and I am a part of the assessment review committee and um, we just, oh, here we go. Um, this is a comprehensive list of the 19 members of our assessment committee um, and we met um, approximately five Wednesdays from 3.30 to 5.30 at Webb Elementary School to um, talk through um, assessment and what, it, and what it looks like. Our first 
job was to figure out what the purpose of assessment was, um, because we give an awful lot of assessment, but we wanted to make sure it was purposeful and that um, we had reason for all of it. Um, so we talked about it driving our instruction to ensure growth for all of our students, to differentiate, to triangulate data by using multiple measures, um, to identify students so that no one falls through the cracks, and to improve instruction and curriculum. So we took time to talk in groups and get together and talk about the purpose. Good evening, my name is Rosalia Polino and I am an English language teacher at Emerson Williams. So one of our the, one of the first tasks that we did at our at our first meeting was to actually sit down in small groups and kind of be truthful about what are some of our hopes and fears about assessment. So we sat down and had some conversations and then shared whole group and we put together a list of some of our hopes and um, some of them were that we hope that this committee would do the work of um, really looking at our assessments and figuring out what it is that we're trying to measure and how it's driving in our instruction and if it's really making an impact in, um, in how we teach our, to our students. And we were also honest about our fears. Um, are we assessing because it's on a calendar and that's what we're supposed to be doing at that time? Um, are we assessing, you know, are we being, um, you know, many repetitions in, in assessing reading or math or writing? So we had some really frank and honest conversations about the things that um, we were fearful about with our assessments. I'd just like to comment. I loved the we hope and we fear. You know, we are in a people business, and this made your um, whole committee and the assessment tools that you used much more human because we're all working together. I loved, we alleviate stress for our students and teachers, and we identify efficient assessments that yield powerful data. That was under we hope. Um, and under we fear that we don't have analysis procedures for staff to purposely and to purposefully and accurately analyze, collaborate, and plan for instruction. That's what this is all about, right? I, I couldn't appreciate both those pages more, so thank you. I guess that's my no. turn. Okay, Dee Dee, get up there. Hi, everybody. I'm Dee Dee Mahoney. I'm a sixth grade um, writing and reading teacher at Charles Wright Elementary School, um, and I was really happy to be part of this committee. I think our work was purposeful, productive, and um, collaborative in a way that I think makes all of us feel really good about the work that we did. Um, it was great about, uh, it came about through an email that asked for voluntary participation across the district, um, and the people that were invited to join along encompass student, or excuse me, teachers from all grade levels across all of our schools. So we have voices from every corner. Um, we, when we did our work, we were separated into groups by grade levels, um, usually two at a time. I was in the fifth and sixth grade group. We had a, pardon? I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, so we, we worked in our teams, then we worked in our, sorry about that, I'll just keep going. Um, in our grade level bands where we um, put more groups together so that we could see if our information and our thinking worked vertically across the curriculum and the things that we were trying to assess. Did the work that we were doing at one level support the folks that were gonna see those students the next year and also in the opposite direction. We wanted to make sure that everything worked out really well. Um, and our discussions, while they started in small group and then moved to bands, also became whole group discussions to make sure that everybody understood what we were all working toward. And interestingly enough, feedback from those conversations um, actually helped some of us make recommendations for changes based on what we learned that happened in other grade levels that some of us weren't already doing just because of the band that we happened to represent. So the work was powerful and purposeful. Um, every voice was heard. We didn't always agree, and that was probably part of the beauty of our discussion because we were able to iron out some of those thoughts. We were able to go back to our schools, talk to our counterparts and colleagues, and say, what do you think, and make sure that those voices were represented as well. Um, our key considerations really had to do with the effect on our students. Chairperson Granado just mentioned some of those things that came up in our hopes and fears. 
Um, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't a stressful situation and that it was purposeful, that the time that we spent doing that was good for our students. We recognize that any time we take time out of instruction, it needs to have huge value. Also, from the teacher perspective, administering assessments, you know, it, we're trying to juggle a curriculum that's weighty and important, and was the time that we were spending worth the time that we were taking away from that work? And what we actually ultimately decided was that it was part of that same work, that the assessment was part of the instruction. It fueled what went after it, and it helped validate what came before it. Um, and also the information that came, again, I mentioned vertically, does it help the folks after us? Does it help the information from the people before us? Does it fuel the work that we're able to do? And we felt that it did. Um, and then ultimately, how does it affect our district? Do we know what we need to know? This year was my first year um, involved in the process of recommending students as they moved up to the middle school and understanding what those expectations were, now being able to see how it starts in K, how it gets to six, and then how it ends up at SDMS was really important to us. Um, some side benefits. We haven't had collaborative time together for a while, so to have representation from all grade levels across all elementary schools, sitting in a room for two hours on a Wednesday when our brains were whatever they were on Wednesday <laughs> afternoons was amazing. Um, we had great conversations, we were relaxed, and it was important, and I think things came up that we didn't anticipate that fueled our discussion. Um, I mentioned the vertical articulation, having an understanding. I didn't know some of the things they did in kindergarten, but I'm really glad I know about them now. Um, and everything was cooperative. Ultimately, I feel like, on behalf of this group of folks, that we feel like we've come up with a common vision that covers across all of our grade levels and all of our elementary schools, serves the needs of our teachers, serves the needs of our students, and serves the needs of our district. I'm gonna turn it over to you now. These were some of the slides that Dee Dee was referring to. My name is Leanne Silver. I'm a reading consultant at Highcrest School. So I'll just quickly go through so you can see the other slides. Um, and the work of the committee really began by talking about the purpose of assessment and having that shared understanding of what the purpose of assessment was. And as we shared in some of the earlier slides, it serves more than one purpose, whether it be formative assessment to drive our instruction, whether it be more summative assessment to look at growth the students have made over the course of the year. Um, that information also helps um, really start instruction for next year's teacher within uh, the new students that they're being handed, as well as being able to identify students that may need some additional support so it acts as a screen for some of our students. Our work continued with the development of an assessment matrix next. And that assessment matrix laid out different criteria that we use for assessment, whether it be the time the assessment takes, the frequency of the assessment, and how that assessment is delivered to students, whether it be whole class, small groups, or individual. We looked at that across grade levels. In each grade level worked on their own, um, their own grade level, looking at reading, writing, math, as well as L assessments that we have already in our district. Then what happened, um, and that was in phase one, Phase two is we took a deeper dive into the assessment and really looked at the purpose, the value of the assessment, and whether or not we would recommend continuing to use that assessment in the future. I love this. <laughs> One of the tasks that we tackled early in our work together was looking at um, the DRA versus the BAS assessment. And um, this T-chart really shows quite clearly our views and our thoughts that we gained together through our collaborative work in discussing both the DRA and BAS. We began this process by first uh, our individual thoughts, so we had a moment to kind of brainstorm and think about our own pros and cons. Um, after that, we met with grade level teams and we shared our thoughts excuse me, at, a, at the table and then we brought that out to a whole group discussion. And really, I think, um, the information we gained here really speaks for itself. And although there are pros and cons to both the DRA and BAS, uh, we really feel that the BAS very much aligns with our focus for our curriculum, our goals for instruction, and how we really assess reading of the students and the information that we want to get about our students as readers. We'll have um, another slide coming up where we'll dig a little bit deeper into uh, BAS and provide you some more information as the slides go on. 
And then another step that we took was, again, to look at the assessment calendar, to look at that matrix that we came up with and identify if there were any gaps, any repetition in assessment, um, to really make sure that, again, for teachers, for students, this assessment calendar would be the most valuable and effective analysis of what we want to get from our students. So we did find um, a couple of areas where there were some repetitions. So we have some suggestions for possibly taking some um, assessments or pieces of assessment away, as well as areas that we thought perhaps were gaps. Um, and we have some recommendations for some additional assessments. One of those was Ames Web, um, because the Ames Web assessment does uh, is a state it's accepted by the state um, as one of our indicators for dyslexia and other reading disabilities, and that's currently being used for our SRBI, our intervention students, but it isn't being served as a universal screen for all of our students. So that's one of our recommendations as a gap that we had, um, that we would be able to, uh, to use that as a universal screen for all of our students. Um, and lastly, again, that final consensus that was big um, with this committee and any decision that we made was a uh, final consensus and that all voices were shared in the next step. Um, the next slide you see will lead you to what our consensus was. Good evening. My name is Kate Barrett. I'm a third grade teacher at Hamner Elementary School. Um, and this is our newly formatted assessment calendar. Um, you can see that it's streamlined to one page. So it is simplified. Um, instead of the bulk of packet we had before, it's nicely laid out so that we can see it. Um, it's teacher friendly. I'm Maria Paro from Hamner School. Um, as you can see, um, and we hope you did get to see, um, you can see the whole continuum of grades as you go across. So I have taught kindergarten and first, so I'm pretty familiar with those. But being on the committee, it was really helpful to see how what we do in the younger grades kind of transpires over or even changes into different assessment as the kids get older. So having it on one sheet is really helpful for teachers to see the whole thing just at a glance. Um, and it just makes it faster for us to look at. Thanks. Uh, my name is Megan Slozinski. I teach fifth grade at High Crest. Um, I wanted to say before we get started with what eliminations we considered, and wanted to present to you is that as a committee, um, this was really um, a leader, leader model um, that's really being implemented here. Um, a huge thank you to the administration who allowed us to do the work and really make the decisions based on what's best for kids and families in town. Um, I think we all felt empowered by the administration that ran this committee, and so we thank them for that, for that support. Um, we're gonna share with you some of the things we'd like to eliminate, so we got the good job. <laughs> Um, you can see on this slide, and I'm just going to point out a couple things. Um, with regards to sit and spelling, we're going to be looking at word work in the upper grades. Um, we didn't feel that sit and spelling addressed all the common core standards that are now in place in the state. And so we thought that was one thing that we could eliminate at this point. Um, another highlight is the MCOMP. That was meant to be um, a test of skills with regards to computation. Um, again, not Connecticut Common Core aligned at this point. Um, so what we're going to... What's, what's an MCOMP? An MCOMP is a quick um, eight-minute test of the computation skills of all grade levels. So if you're first grade, it might just be crossing? Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's grades two through six. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's grades two through six. Oh, okay. um, it's, a, it's a situation where it just doesn't align to what the common core is at this point. We are going to be investigating, and someone will share that with you, some of the other alternatives that might be available for fact fluency and things of that nature, because we do think that's valuable for our students. Uh, my name is Brandon Palma. I am a grade five teacher at Hanmer. Um, as you'll also see on this list, the uh, developmental reading assessment, or as you may know, the DRA is also something that we were planning to eliminate. As you saw in the earlier slides, the uh, pros of the BAS uh, far outweigh the pros of the DRA um, based on where we're going in the coming years. The COGAT in grade three is also a very lengthy and um, time consuming process for a lot of the students in grade three. And it is a test that is used to indicate gifted students, but actually our star reading and math tests 
do that already. So we were actually repeating the same exact test and putting extra test measures in place for grade three. Um, we are eliminating typing training on grades two through six. It is a program that is, how can I say, very rudimentary when it comes to um, typing on the computer and there's no um, way of fully implementing it in the classroom that helps the students become more avid typers. They actually have more of an opportunity during Writers and Rears workshop working through the TC model of typing their published pieces that they actually build that word per minute speed that we start to develop in later in life with computers. And now that we have one-to-one -one Chromebooks in the upper grades and more Chromebooks and iPads rolling out, these kids are having more access to keyboards to increase those words per minute. Um, we also discussed uh, eliminating the on-demand writing process. The on-demand writing process in grades five through six will turn into three digitally published pieces based on three of the um, main TC units. Uh, grades one through four are considering what's a type of performance task. They will talk about that during the changes. Um, we also discussed eliminating the Go Math end of year test, not eliminating it in the sense that we will no longer use it in the district, but instead it will be rolled out district wide to allow kids to practice over the summer. It is not a device that is helpful beyond what we are doing in the classroom with unit tests in Go Math. The unit tests are showing us what domains the students are proficient in and what students are still approaching standards in, and the uh, STAR math and other math assessments provide that as well in our classrooms. And we're still going to be providing the opportunity for parents to um, be able to access the Go Math over the summer. So that's what that, that was our solution that we would still assign it as an optional summer practice for students. Yes, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah, um, and finally, the sentencification and concepts of print in case one and two are recommended to be Im eliminated because they are repeating something that I believe has to do with the Ames Web. The, the, the TC phonics spelling inventory. Oh, those, both of those assessments are tied into the TC phonics inventory, and the folks that are coming up next will talk about that more. Tammy, what's concepts in print? Um, it's part of the kindergarten benchmark assessment. Um, it's just a section of it. What, what may they be asked? to do for us um, in the back. Like book handling skills, like what are the front covers, okay. what are the back okay. covers. Got it. Thank you. Can you turn the book upside down? Are they okay. able okay. to turn Thank it? You. you know what? That's yep. fine. I just don't know if on my side it was able to. All right. So we have, my name is Jenna Garcia. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Webb. Um, and we have some changes that we recommend. Um, first, the kindergarten benchmark assessment. Um, this has been a successful assessment in the, at the kindergarten level. Um, and it focuses on the early literacy skills. Um, we recommend that this time we want uh, the full administration to go to a partial administration because we found through our research and discussion that the assessment um, has some areas that overlap with our STAR assessment. Um, also, and in, the grade, in grades two to six, um, we want to replace the sit and spelling inventory with the developmental spelling inventory. And what the developmental um, spelling inventory is, is just um, a teacher would administer a list of words to the whole class. It would take about 20 minutes. Um, and some of the first, or first grade teachers and second grade teachers um, are able to use that now. Um, and the teacher is just able to see the strengths and weaknesses of the um, phonics principles in the, through this assessment. Um, and then um, another assessment, um, the TC phonics inventory will be replacing the sentence dictation. And kindergarten and first grade had a wonderful opportunity this year to work with the phonics program that is so um, systematically aligns with our reading and writing curriculum. Um, it's been well received from both teachers and the students, had such a great impact on their learning as well as the engagement of the phonics instruction. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, um, I actually had the opportunity of administering this assessment and um, it was so engaging. They had fun. Phonics inventory you're talking yes. about? Yes. The, um, it's a picture and it tells a story and the children have to write the words um, aligned with um, the story that you're telling. It's very um, developmentally appropriate. For kindergarten mm -hmm. um, and first grade, of course. 
Hi, I'm Nicole Utrusis. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Emerson Williams. Um, one assessment that we are changing as well is the AIMSWeb test of early literacy. This assessment, as Leanne had talked about, is an assessment that is a universal screen for dyslexia, which our district really needs, especially going forward when, you know, when you're in a meeting, and sometimes that assessment would be very helpful going forward with parent meetings as well. Um, this assessment is one minute timed. Um, so this assessment is letter naming, letter sound, and there's a phoneme segmentation part as well. And for first grade, it goes into the nonsense words assessment, which again is very helpful for um, identifying students with dyslexia, especially that nonsense words part of the assessment. Another assessment that is being changed is the AIMSWeb test of early numeracy. Um, for grade one, instead of doing three assessments or three administrations of this assessment, they would only do it one time in the fall. If students master the concepts in the assessment, then they would not have to do it again in you know January and then in May again because they already mastered that concept, which is counting to 100, identifying numbers, finding the missing numbers. This will still be used um, in first grade for SRBI, so for the interventions as well. Um, and then again, the assessment that we've been all talking about is the Fontes and Pinnell BAS assessment will be replacing the DRA. So we'll have another uh, person come up and talk more about the BAS and all parts of it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Brush. I'm a second grade teacher at Highcrest. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about our decision behind um, going to BAS rather than the DRA. Um, we did find when researching and learning more about BAS that it is much more closely aligned with the Common Core State Standards um, as well as our Reader's Workshop model that we use in our classrooms. Um, the conversation that takes place with students after reading is a much more natural conversation. It's very similar to how we confer with students during the Reader's Workshop time. Um, compared with the direct questioning that is um, a part of the DRA assessment. Students are also allowed to use the text during the BAS comprehension conversation, which supports what we want in our classrooms when students are talking with us about their text. Um, questions that drive the conversation are much deeper and require the children to think critically. They need to summarize and synthesize the big ideas of the text rather than simply responding to surface level questions. During the assessment, the teacher will identify three reading levels for all students, their independent reading level, their instructional reading level, and a hard reading level. Um, another word for it might be their challenging level text, a level that's above their instructional level. Um, by identifying these three different levels, we're really trying to find where the child, the point in, t in reading where the child is freed up from decoding and accuracy and can really do more of that deep thinking about the text. Um, the assessment really allows the students to work within bands of text rather than being um, pinpointed in one specific level and they can stretch their instructional range. Analysis of the assessment highlights specific areas of strength and weakness in the areas of fluency decoding and comprehension. The analysis helps teachers to highlight a student's thinking about the text and within the text. Careful BAS analysis allows the teacher to identify specific teaching points. It allows us to look for patterns across students to form small groups and to develop instructional areas of focus. In short, BAS analysis drives our instruction. The materials that come with the BAS program um, were also very positively received. The student texts are shorter, they're more engaging for children, they're more culturally responsive, and they include fiction and nonfiction texts at every level. Teacher materials include uh, the Literacy Continuum Guide, which provides specific teaching points that are directly aligned to student areas of struggle. So in summary, moving to BAS for us means shifting our focus from assessing to instruction. BAS will help us learn more about our readers and deliver more powerful and effective instruction. Um, and we're really excited to begin with it. I see many of you shaking your heads, um, yes. Um, <laughs> at, this was your optional year, I understand, that we we're just phasing it in, but do you all got to try it with the students? Okay, great.
individual can be defined. Mm -hmm. in, the DR, in the DRA, um, at a particular level, you might have four fiction books and oh, four okay. nonfiction books. In the back, you only have two per level. So once a child starts mm -hmm. with those, you yeah. right, you're looking for other options. Yeah, but there's all that one child mm -hmm. in that book. That's not necessarily the whole of the community. Um, so what do you do? Very, well, we talked yeah. about using the progress marker and doing oh, okay. grades, okay. Okay. Um, so for completing assessments, other types of similar um, activity we talked about. Do you about. think that will happen often? I no, sir. I think that what, one of the things that we've talked about is that the better we get at that, no, of course. the more accurate we will be. Yeah. Of course, we already talk with our kids, so we have a good idea yeah. of where they are. Yeah. So the better we get, the better we'll be able to target so that this, those situations will occur less and less right. over time. Right. That helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, I have a little sister, so I have a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old. Yep. Can't tell them. I'm trying to figure out how and what we're going to teach them. Oh, it's always <laughs> Can I ask the question, um, next year, can you guys come back and tell us how it went? I'm, I'm serious. And, and um, have the freedom to say this worked and this didn't work? I give you that freedom, okay. Thank you. That would be, no, that really would be um, probably the best way to do this is every year evaluate it. Don't spend a lot of time, just get, get together, you know, half day Wednesday. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate and the board appreciates the work that you put into this because we do have a question of time all the time. And this is a way that we can say our time is being used to the most um, successful way for these kids that we can possibly find. So I thank you. A lot of work, huh? This was Herculean. Thank you. I think the eliminations help greatly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is the I think we get more bang for our buck with what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The time that will be spent will be valuable yeah. and drive our instruction to what's best for kids of course. instead of any kind of extra. Okay. You know, I had one question. Where do you put all the data? For some of the oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> making sure it went somewhere, you know, that's all. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Go. Yes, yeah. I so appreciate. Yeah, I think we all do. I applaud you. Thank you for Thank taking you very much. Thank Thank you. You. Anyone else have questions or comments? I just really, I'd love things on one page. Mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm old enough so that um, they used to have a resume could be no longer than one page. So. I think this is fantastic yeah. because I've seen what the other one looked like, and this one is much better. Yeah. Thank you. Right. We just want to make yeah. sure that we uh, we give a little shout out to um, Jim, Tamara, Pauline, and Siobhan for really allowing us to take that leader leader um, initiative and, and give us the flexibility and the time to do this important work. If it wasn't for them guiding us, I think it would be a lot harder. And they did provide some ideas. I smelled that over at web. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Now, I just want to say thank you as well. This goes with our goals, the board's goals. And we had a retreat, and it's exactly part of what we're trying mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. is the communication needs to be open. We're, we're not, it's a small community, but we seem to, there were parts that not, fixed and what we're trying to do is what I see is your volunteerism beyond teaching to make it work for us in our district so I thank you for that thank you you are doing what's best for kids there thank you go. thank you thank you great awesome job thank you okay Thank you all again. Thank you.
All right, Board of Ed meetings held. Finance and Information Management Committee, Kevin, our finance chair, is not here, but he did comment on these after our last meeting, which was April 23rd. Our special Board of Ed meeting, our board retreat, which was on May 1st. Ginger, would you speak to that? I will, Madam Chair. On May 1st, a board retreat was held at Stillman, attended by members of the board, system administration, and the leadership of all seven schools. This leadership included both principals and faculty team leaders involved with the implementation of the leader-leader model adopted by the board in its strategic plan. <coughs> Mr. Emmett opened the meeting with an update on several expectations which had been expressed by the board, naming, naming Lee, or, that's a weird word. <laughs> namely. namely. Namely, thank you. Walkthroughs by district administration will be limited to those required by state mandate. Professional development is now being coordinated to minimize the amount of instructional time missed by the teaching faculty. And the work of the assessment committee, which we heard from earlier just now, was previewed. The remainder of the retreat consisted of school by school updates on the status of the leader leader model implementation in every school. Some schools are further along than others, but all have created leadership teams comprised of enthusiastic volunteers. All agree that the work of implementing a leader leader model is challenging and will take time, but agree that school culture, instruction, and student instruction will benefit from its implementation. Uh, Ginger, thank you. It was, it was a great retreat. I enjoyed it, and I think everyone else did. And one of the things that we talked about was to sustain this. You know, not to be changing programs every year or every two years, that we let them mature. Very nice, thank you. And then we had another special Board of Ed meeting, which was a grievance, Diane? Um, several members of the board met to hear a grievance um, from one of the teachers regarding um, p her use of PL time and the exception to the PL time. Okay, thank you. Um, Memorial Day Parade Committee, John, it's coming. It's going to be here before we know it, and it will be sunny, because I think all the rain is out of the way right now. Right. I really do. Oh, I hope. Um, but having said that, <coughs> the uh, parade is pretty much all put together. If you walked into the council chambers tonight, you saw the sixth saw grade those, posters. Yes. Each elementary school took part in doing that and what Memorial Day meant to them. They did a phenomenal job. I wanted to thank all the... Uh, individuals involved in doing that so it's a great great opportunity to see it happen so we're thankful for that the uh, essay contest winners have been selected at our uh, meeting on May 8th this year the committee went with two individuals the, the essays were phenomenal the winners are Isabel Barubi and Annie Hart great two eighth grade individuals at the Silas Dean Middle School. And they will read their essays um, at the parade uh, at the end of the cemetery. It is online right now in the Parks and Rec on the Memorial Day Parade. And uh, they've been contacted. Uh, the screams in the background and the families were so exciting. It's great. They're all happy. Good, good group of essay uh, uh, recipients and two excellent winners. Um, we also were able to reach out to Gold Star and Blue Star families, and we did find some. So our Grand Marshals will be those families. Uh -huh. So uh, if you happen to have an opportunity to have a conversation with them, they will be leading the parade as the Grand Marshals. And um, I think it's going to be a wonderful day, and we are very honored and proud in Weathersfield uh, to be able to salute those veterans. So we're, we're excited, we're ready. Great, so. thank you, John. Any questions for John? Okay, thank you. And then Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, WEC, which was Monday. Michael, you yes. wanna address that? Uh, happily, uh, I attended the WEC meeting yesterday at the library, yesterday afternoon. Uh, we had a great presentation from Kathy Kanya who talked about the birth to three process and how the birth to three process works and provides that bridge to um, our services once the children turn three. 
Um, in addition to that, our WEC staff, uh, Kim and Lisa, provided us with some data in terms of uh, BMI for students, body mass index, mm. uh, as well as some educational data as well. So um, we're getting to the point where we're near the end of the year and we'll be thinking ahead to next year, but WEC is alive and well. And what we've seen a lot of this year is with the ALICE work, with the WEC work, there's a lot of connection and a lot of resources going back and forth. So. Um, we certainly hope to continue to see the work that WEC does continue and um, make a difference in our families' lives. The WEC Great. work. The WEC work. That's There's right. There's a <laughs> lot of acronyms there, huh? WEC. Got it right. <laughs> Alice. Got it right. Okay. Um, we have meeting scheduled. Correct Council is on May 15th. Um, student Program and Services is on May 21st at 6.30. Oh, excuse me, correct council's at 3 o'clock, Ginger. It you actually, see that? they changed it, thank heavens. Okay. It's at noon All right. tomorrow, so I, okay. I will be there. Okay, thank you. And then Student Program and Services is on um, May 21st, 6.30, and Finance and Information Management Committee will be before our board meeting on 5.28 at 6.15. Is there any unfinished business on the board? Okay. All right. And now, if there's anyone wishing to make a public comment, please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that you have a five minute limit. Good evening, my name's Lisa Thibodeau. Um, I hope it's okay I'm speaking because I am not a resident of Weathersfield. My address is 414 Eastbury Hill Road in Glastonbury. Um, but I felt compelled after what I heard earlier today to speak. I was gonna be a silent um, participant out there, um, but I, I just felt called to speak. I personally have played hockey for 32 years, including at the collegiate level, and for many different coaches, including Coach Tula Mary. Expectations were always high in terms of play and personal conduct. Because of the positive impact I've had from coaches I've had in the past, including him, I decided to enter the coaching ranks and I coached youth hockey for eight years, um, my son's team, and now I am currently a high school coach in the girls' high school hockey programs in Connecticut. Um, sorry, I'm nervous because I really wasn't planning on this. Um, I do want to speak to his personal dedication and commitment. Um, it's unprecedented. I've been around hockey, like I said, for 32 years and I've never seen anything like it. Um, he does off-season team building. Um, the time, I, I'm not sure if there's another sport um, where you can find a coach that puts in that much time. Um, I've seen it. Uh, I also want to say that I know for a fact that he does continuing education and he is um, always looking for what is happening now. So I kind of wanted to address that as a direct rebuttal, but I know, you know, they've all left. So that's fine, um, because I really wanted to talk to you guys, because that's what's important. Um, practices are planned uh, for, for this team, and I, again, I know this, um, using drills that are often used at the collegiate level. I know this because I know that he's gone and watched collegiate practices um, and used those, those things. So the expectations are high. Like I said, they're high. Um, I also really want to say that Every year, I know there's at least one player that comes back and says thank you. Um, and, and it's kind of moving to hear those stories because uh, one of the gentlemen is an officer who was in town. Uh, another gentleman was a military veteran. Um, there's people that have come back to say thank you, you've shaped me into who I am. Um, some, maybe they didn't have a strong father figure and that's who he became to them. Um, there's all there's different stories and and you know nobody's perfect but um, I want you to hear those stories um, because those are the ones that um, I'm personally proud of. Um, I received a copy of a message today that was sent two years ago to a friend of mine when a former player they do a lot of fundraising former player purchased T-shirts to help support the team, and in that message he said that. Coach Tulamary was an inspiration, and he is the man he is today because of high school hockey. And he was uh, the first class that, that Coach Tulamary coached, so this is going back quite a few years. But I also want to say, please don't assume that the people that are not here are afraid 
um, of any retaliation, many of them are afraid to be associated what, with what was happening. Um, that I also know. And I can tell you all of this because he's my dad. Um, this is where I'm going to try not to get emotional. Um, but he, you know, it was okay. Listen, he's a strong man. He can handle people talking about him. Um, that's harder for me to handle. But I want you to know everything that he's put into this team has been for the kids. Um, I have three older brothers. We all played hockey. He did nothing but encourage us. Um, so, you know, talk to him. You'll, you'll know. You'll know who he is. You'll know who he really is. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. It's 414 okay. East Ferry, which is one word, Hill Road, Washington. Okay, anyone else with a comment? Okay, are there any board comments? Elaine? I would just like to <coughs> say that the assessment committee did far beyond what our expectations were. I'm very pleased with all the data they shared with us tonight. I'm thrilled with the way they work together, collaboratively, vertical articulation. Um, those teachers put a lot into doing that so it came out right for the kids and I want to thank them. That's all. Thanks for the comment. Diane? Um, I'd like to speak to this hockey situation. Um, as I read these letters this week and I heard some of the parents sp speak, um, I had deja vu and as we're sitting here, I was getting texts from um, parents who endured a similar situation with the girls' soccer coach. What's concerning to me is that kids and parents brought these concerns forward to the administration and felt like it came upon deaf ears. We had that same similar experience. Somewhere between point A and point B is the truth. Some of the things I read this week and some of the things I heard tonight, I found appalling. And as an HR professional, if that occurred in the workplace and those allegations were substantiated, it would have been a hostile work environment. I feel very strongly about kids in sports and teams, whether it be a band or an athletic team or whatever, but we're teaching them some very important skills because I can tell you right now in my career, I can go into a meeting and work with a team and I can tell you who participated mm -hmm. in sports, who, who was in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and who le learned that working towards a common goal. It's very disheartening to me when I hear about kids who all their lives up until high school have really loved a sport, whether it be soccer, hockey, basketball, whatever. And then when they get to high school, um, their, the love for their sport is damaged. Um, I really think at this point, given what we've heard, that there needs to be an independent investigation of the coaching staff before we move forward with any contracts and rehiring people. This is very concerning to me, especially with the concussion issue um, and so, some of the things we heard. And we don't know, we're just hearing what people are saying, but I think as a board, we have an obligation to conduct an independent um, investigation to see if these claims are substantiated or unsubstantiated before we rehire anybody. Thank you, D Diane, that was excellent. Um, I did speak with Michael, Michael Emmett, and that we would get together with um, the athletic director and the principal of the school to sit down as the adults and to see where we go from here, because I agree with you. Something has to be talked about first, has to be a discussion, and then we can move forward. Thank you. Anyone else? I agree with Diane's point of view. Um, I've had personal experiences of the same nature. I have children who loved sports from five years up and then not so much once they got to high school. So I just wanted to um, support Diane's 
suggestion that we have an investigation. Okay, hey, John. I'm just happy to hear the conversation is going to be continued, mm -hmm. and that all it has the, to be um, adults will be able to speak and get the uh, information out. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they're good people and they meant well, but at the end of the day, something is not appropriately happening. Oh, thank you. And I think we need to, to hear from the kids too. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, I always like to end at this time um, to communicate all the other organizations that we work with. Um, the Wethersfield Education Foundation in Unico presented Gina Barreca, and for those of you who were there on April 25th, it was a fundraiser for both organizations, and it was actually a hilarious evening. It was very successful and very enjoyable, and I know the Wethersfield Education Foundation hopes to continue um, to raise money by having speakers come in. It was great. The Career Advisory Board met on April 30th at the high school. The group discussed the possibility of having, I love this, a signing day for our students as they graduate to their next step. Not just signing recognition for sports, we're just talking about sports, but the same idea for other things that our students are moving on to. Mark Danaher is organizing a career fair for May 23rd at the high school. Mark is also organizing mock interviews for the students to be better prepared with their resumes, their business dress code, and their interview practice. Mark would all like as many businesses as possible, so anybody out there listening to volunteer for this practice, you'll be the interviewer, which is being held on May 17th at the high school. Um, Michael and I did attend the United Way Alice's Challenge meeting. Alice, which is an acronym, a lot of acronyms, for Asset Limited, <laughs> Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. It has taken three sessions. They've been most interesting to even get close to a solution we liked on how Wethersfield can utilize the United Way's money and assistance. And I think we found it like at the end of the third meeting. So we will be meeting again, as you stated, to work on details. Keen on Kids Coalition met on May 9th. You know how we love them. Caroline Fazzino reported that 1,144 students have enrolled in the spring after school programs. She does continue to research what barriers may be causing some students not to be part of these amazing activities. And Caroline is also busy on next year's program and one includes, it caught my ear, girls only on computer coding. There we go. The Keene Foundation funded our Broadway series, my own name, as the elementary schools put on incredible productions of Annie, that was at Charles Wright, Cinderella, that was at Webb. Mr. Kopp, are you gonna stand up and we'll applaud? Yes, that was excellent. <laughs> and Lion King, <laughs> and our Lion King. Students in theater are a winning combination. They bring confidence, teamwork, and high literacy skills to all involved. Uh, Silestein Middle School, sponsored by the Keene Foundation, has after school tutoring and intramural sports. And next year, the introduction of flag football. Again, the goal is to increase participation for all the students at the middle school in their after school programs. And the Hunger Action Team hat met last Friday and this group continues to address our concerns that our town's children and adults have access to healthy food. Chartwells, which is our school's meal provider, reported that in their recent audit, they were given great praise for their fresh fruit and vegetables. Now we just gotta get the children to eat them. <laughs> um, and their new grab and go breakfast, which I think is a wonderful and a successful initiative. Silestine Middle School, led by students Anna Griffin and Christine Von Visuto, reported on the food drive for May at the middle school, and it's called Spread the Love. And Anna is working, this is Anna Griffin, is working on Souls for Souls. And she herself is working on, as part of a worldwide program that has given out more than 35 million pairs of shoes to 127 different countries. I was in awe of that one. <laughs> Uh, the board truly admires and supports all our students who are 
becoming more civically aware in their civic activities. So as I talk about students and their civic activities, what do we hear from you, Eden? Hi, well thank you very much. So first I wanna thank everybody who spoke tonight. I know it's not always easy. And I'd also like to thank Mrs. Fitzpatrick. I agree that there should be an investigation and that students should feel that they can come forward and speak. Um, also going on at the high school, um, the choir concert is this Thursday. It's a big senior night. I'm, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I committed to Eastern a couple days ago, and I will be Congratulations. going Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, also, this Friday, um, we're having a blood drive run by the students, which is always just a wonderful effort. Everyone, they're so kind, and just it's, it's really run well, and I have to applaud the students on it. Yeah, that's great. The civic awareness, too, at the high school. It is. Always, I, I'm in awe of them. Very nice. All right, any other comments? All right, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. A second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, anybody saying no? Any objections? <laughs> any abstentions? She was looking at me. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming tonight and for watching. The board wishes you a good night.